Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see all of you. I met lots of new folks today, which is absolutely wonderful. Now we're looking at Colossians chapter number 1, beginning with verse 15, read down into verse number 20. I'm preaching through Colossians, which is a privilege for me. It's the first time in my 44 years of being a pastor. <laughs> it's a long time. <laughs> that I had a chance to preach through Colossians. I've done a message here and there from Colossians, but never all the way through. And so we're doing that right now. We'll begin with verse 15 of uh, chapter 1. We've done into verse number 20. And let's begin to read. It'll be on the screens for you as well. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth, or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, I mentioned before to you that uh, Colossians is a very complex book. It may be the most complex book in the whole New Testament. It certainly there's some passages like this one that are extremely difficult. And I know that uh, we're, this is not a seminary classroom, and we're not theology students, and we're, and we're not philosophy students. I was a philosophy major, can you believe it or not? When I graduated from college, I went out and started a little philosophy shop. That didn't last very long, you know. So I know that we're not theology students, philosophy students, and we're just normal people just trying to understand the deep things of Scripture. So well, my job is to try to take these difficult things and to make them understandable, to make them relate to us, to help them grab a hold of it. And certainly here we have some extremely deep and powerful teaching. Now, uh, this message this morning is not about this, but I want to talk about it as I go along. What we just read is a hymn. Scholars call it the hymn to Jesus. Maybe the, the, the title of it could be Jesus is Supreme. There have been books, 100 page, 200 page books written analyzing the hymn to Jesus. We don't know very much about the worship that was done in the first century by the early church. We only have a little peak here and there, and we have one of those peaks right here. I can tell you this about worship early church. It was probably different than the worship we do now. And it may have differed from church to church because there were Gentile Christians and Gentile churches, and there were Jewish Christians and Jewish churches. And as you went all across the Roman Empire and found the church, they probably did things differently in different places. Worship is always about God. He's the center of our worship. But it comes out of the life of the people. So, so that the people can understand it. And, and so if this was a hymn, there was probably a tune. We don't know what the tune was, but they were very familiar with the tune because Paul did not write this hymn. He pulled it out because it, it said something about Jesus that he wanted to be, be clear and he wanted to underline it. Most likely Paul took the words of this hymn and tailored it or changed it a little bit to bring out more of what his teaching was. And so I kind of like this. Here we are reading worship from the first century and relating to what they did there at that time. Now Paul goes on in Colossians, and I'm going to be talking about this in Colossians chapter 3, probably in the summer of 2025. That's how long it takes to go through Colossians, you see. Um, Paul talks in chapter 3 about uh, different kinds of music inside the church. He talks about, about psalms, which are probably... Psalms from the Old Testament, also maybe poems that were written in that, in that time. Hymns, which are formal theological statements written to a tomb, which is probably recorded and written down, much like our hymns are now. And then spiritual songs, which almost certainly are, are, are little choruses, maybe spontaneous, that the, the church sang to express their joy in worship. And so here we have an example of one of those hymns which expresses deep theological truth in a way that people could understand. And remember, it's the hymn to Jesus, and we could title it, Jesus is Supreme. And here's what Paul says in the form of this hymn. 
Jesus is God. He is not a God. He didn't become God. Jesus has always been God. He is the image of the invisible God. Now that word there for image, and I'm going to use a Greek word, it's okay. It's the word icon, a word that we sometimes use now, the word icon. And it means sort of like what you have when the emperor's head is stamped on a coin. Uh, and, and that stamp, you see what the emperor looks like. You can see some of his qualities. And, and so Jesus is like God stamping himself from creation. So when we see Jesus, we can see God. As Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 15, when you see me, you've seen the Father. So what our Lord was expressing was that the invisible God, who is the king of all creation, who is everywhere but is unseen, can be made known by knowing Jesus. But that word icon began to change its meaning a little bit as time went on. So that it meant not just the picture of whatever was being represented, but it became the thing itself. Now I have in my pocket a penny. Here it is. And this penny I, I found when I was out walking. Now when I walk, I find money all the time. Not big money. Boy, I would love to find a $100 bill. I really would. That'd be so, so, so cool. But I find pennies and nickels and dimes and quarters. And one time I found a 50 cent piece. Whoa! <laughs> big money. And um, whenever I find a penny, unless it's heads up, I don't pick it up. Not because I'm superstitious, but I figure if I'm going to take the trouble to bend over and pick up a penny, it better be showing me its best side. <laughs> And so I'm out walking, I see this penny here. And on the, the front of the penny is Abraham Lincoln. That's his picture. Now this is not Honest Abe. It's the picture of Honest Abe. This penny doesn't do anything. It can't even buy anything. But you see the picture. But in the first century what happened was that as time went on, the, the picture came to change to being actually, when they use the word, refer to the presence of what was pictured. And that is what Paul is doing here. He's saying he is the image of the invisible God. Not only that we can see Jesus and know the invisible God, but that God is actually present with us in Jesus. And he's the firstborn over all creation. I wish that the NIV had translated a little bit differently. Because some people have taken that word firstborn and indicated that Jesus was born, they had a beginning in time. But that word actually means the one who is the heir of everything. Like, you know, sometimes when a will is given out, that the all, everything's left to the oldest one. So Jesus has the heir of all that God has created. So everything belongs to him. Not only is he God present with us, but everything in creation belongs. And the reason why is that all things were made by him. I, I think about John's Gospel, chapter 1, which certainly Paul must have known about. The in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the words, Word was with God, and all things that were made were made by him, and nothing that exists was made without his creation effort. Paul saying exactly the same thing here says that all things were made by Jesus. Now, the, the power comes from God. God is the architect. God worked through, through the Lord Jesus to make all things, and the Holy Spirit was the one doing the actual work. The Spirit of God moved across the face of the waters. Now, I'm going to show you one of my most precious possessions. This comes from the Ernie Myers Museum. In 1998-99, we built this wonderful building. We relocated this spot from a, from a few blocks away and, and built this beautiful place for $4.2 million. It would be almost uh, $12 million now with inflation. Isn't it amazing? And the contractor, who was the one who planned the building, had an architect on staff. I knew the contractor. I knew the architect. And... I met a lot of the workers who were coming. I met the guy who was the construction foreman. They gave me a hat. On the back of it, it says pastor. Like that. And I would put this hat on, and I'd walk around, you know. And I would uh, look like I was important. 
but I actually did nothing. I'm very pleased that after 23 years, this thing still fits me. I didn't change it either because my head's a lot fatter now than it was back then. So I walked around and I watched what was going on and I had so little power that the day before they put up the steel beams and hold up this roof, I walked around with my wife with a big magic marker and I wrote scripture verses all over the beams so that I could say that I stood here. Because you know, right here, very below the, the pulpit in the floor is a Bible. We buried it there as a way of saying we always stand on God's Word. It's underneath the floor here. So I wrote all these scripture verses on all these. I spent several hours doing that. I felt so spiritual, so holy doing that. And then the next day I came and found out the workers had erased all of it. <laughs> That's how much power I had. So, so the contractor, the, the architect, the guy overseeing the construction, the, the workers on the field, they did all the things that were done, and I just walked around with my hat on and looked important. I want you to hear this. Jesus just didn't walk around. He was the agency, the one through whom God worked to bring about all creation. And, by the way, that's why it all belongs to him as the heir. And he still is working. All things that exist now are held together by the power of Jesus Christ. What Paul is teaching here is that Jesus is God. Not a God. He didn't become God. He is God. And when you see Jesus, you see the Father. And it's not just that you see him and see the Father. When you know Jesus and you're with Jesus and you experience Jesus, you are experiencing God. And we have a, an opportunity to look at all that God made. We know that Jesus was there when it was being done and God worked through Jesus to make it happen. And he is the head of the church, which means he's a living, real relationship between Jesus, who is our Savior, and the church that he founded. You know, people look at church all kinds of ways, and some people look at church as being an institution with uh, bishops and pastors and deacons and all levels of authority and all kinds of rules and regulations. And if you look at church that way, you miss out on what church is really. Church is really the body of Christ. Now, I, I, I hope you're catching this. Not only did God work through him to create all things, Jesus is still working in the world, and he's working through the world through his church. And so he's head of all creation, but he's also the head of all mankind through his church. He is here. He is with us. He is alive. He is powerful. And when the church works, what we're doing is working with the power of Jesus. We are him working in the world. Now, we talked about this before. Paul had a very high view of his church. Let me stop for a moment. He had a high view of Jesus. He taught and believed that Jesus was God. And he had a, also had a very high view of the church, that he was working through the church to reach the world and to change things. Now, the story I'm getting ready to tell you is true, but it's a composite story. I put a lot of ingredients into a pot, stir it a little bit, because I've been told this so many times across the years. And so I'm telling you a story which is true, but which is many different people, and I don't think I've changed it enough. I think I've changed it enough so nobody can figure out who it is. But about 20 years ago, a family joined church, and uh, they were excited when they joined, and a few weeks later, I didn't see them. And it went on for a little bit, and so I, I called a lady on the phone and said, you know, I've noticed you're not in church. I kind of miss you. I'm a little worried about you. She says, oh, listen, we joined church because we needed a church home, but we're really not church people, so you won't see us very much. And I haven't seen him for 20 years. <laughs> well, we join church because we need a church home, but we're not church people. And I'm trying to figure out something here. So you say you're a Christian. You say you believe in Jesus, but you don't believe in the, 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 the group of people that are his body working in the world, that he's head of his church and he's really present whenever we get the chance to get together to worship. You don't believe that. And for everyone who's listening to me now, all those out there who are listening to the sound of my voice online, Wes Portsmouth is not on the big screen today. Pastor Cal is preaching to all those guests who have come so he can share with them the vision for the West Portsmouth campus. But anyway, whoever's out there, listen, this is not an ordinary group of people meeting together because they want to meet. 
We are the body of Christ. He is working here visibly and powerfully to lead us. And what happens in the world that leads folks to Jesus happens through his church. Now, he may have some other, some other plan. He may perform a miracle of some kind outside the church. That is his prerogative as the great God of all the universe. But we are his people. And how can you say you believe in Jesus and don't believe in his church? Makes no sense. And then Paul goes on to say that he is the one, Jesus is the one who reconciles all creation to himself. Now, it's not just individual human beings like me and you that need to be saved. All creation needs to be saved. When sin entered the world, it was like a, an acid that came in and corroded everything. You know, you probably wonder, why is there evil in the universe? Why do people suffer and, and go through bad things? Because creation itself is what we call fallen. All of creation has fallen away from God. Not just human beings, but all of creation. We sold our house in, uh, in uh, September of... Um, 2011, moved to Culpeper Landing. And I didn't know this, but the flashing around our, our chimney was not intact. I don't even know what flashing is. Let me put my construction helmet back on again. <laughs> I'm not even sure I know what flashing is. But it wasn't working. And every time it rained, water would come down our chimney and go down into the foundation. And without our knowing about it, our foundation has substantially rotted away. So we had a buyer come by the house and of course, you, you have a, a pre-sale inspection. So the inspector came in, and it came out and said, your foundation needs to be completely redone. It cost us $10,000. All of our profit got eaten up. I'm sorry I'm selling you, t telling you my sad tale of woe, <laughs> but that's what happened. And so all the foundation was, was rotten. It had to be replaced. And that's kind of like what it is with creation. Creation, because of sin, has rotted away. And when, when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, it was not just for you. It was to redeem and reconcile, bring back to God all of creation. Everything that exists that he originally created is now touched by his grace and saved and brought back to God. Now, God's purpose was to reconcile everything that exists to him for the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, we're getting a little bit back to the nature of Jesus when Paul expresses this. The reason his, re his reconciling power has power is that God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in Jesus. And what this means is that everything God is, Jesus is. Everything God is, Jesus is. Now, he was both God and man. Paul says in Romans chapter 5 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Jesus is the second Adam. Now what that means is this. There was a first Adam who disobeyed God and led all of his children after into sin. So the first Adam was disobedient and brought sin into the world. Paul says Jesus is the second Adam who's obedient to God and now his children, that's you and me who believe, can be obedient to God and become a new race of people that belong to Adam. So Paul makes it very clear there that, that Jesus is fully human. But at the same time, all of God's fullness is inside of him. So that Jesus is fully God and fully man. What some people do is they diminish the humanity of Jesus. And so that, that, that by diminishing the humanity of Jesus, they take away from his own suffering, from his own temptations that his death on the cross wasn't that big of a deal, that, it, that his body, you know, was broken, his blood was shed, but so what? He's not really fully human being. He's, just a, he's kind of like God in a human suit. And that really is not what the New Testament teaches. In the man Jesus, the fullness of God dwelt. Now, I was thinking about this recently because I was you know, working on the, on the message for several weeks, and I read about... Um, the zoo in, in China, and I'm, I, my Chinese is not very good, so I, I might say this right, but it's the Hangzhou Zoo. The Hangzhou Zoo had a, has an exhibit of sun bears, which are an Asian bear. It's not a very big bear, 
And, and people are looking at the exhibit of the bear and see the, see the bear and they start saying, he looks like a human in a bear suit. Maybe something happened to the bear and they had to cover it up. And I want to show you the picture right now. See what you think. So, so in the first frame there, you see that he's kind of standing up, working the crowd like this. He's like he's a stand-up comedian. And if you look in the third panel, you see the wrinkles. <laughs> it looks like that he's a, a human in a bear suit. Thank you for loving this. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And that's kind of like this picture we get from some people that Jesus was God in a human suit. That's not the case. He's fully God. He's fully human. He's both God and man. And that is part of this wonderful mystery, this wonderful miracle called the Trinity. That God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three natures, three persons, but yet one being. Now, do I understand the Trinity? I do not. I don't. I think the best thing to do is, even though we don't understand it, but to, to accept it because it's taught very clearly in Scripture and it has a tremendous amount of spiritual power. And the first thing I do when I get to heaven is I'm going to ask God to explain two things. First, the infill fly rule. Because although I've played baseball all my life and been involved in baseball, I still don't quite understand the infill fly rule. And secondly, I'm going to ask Him to explain the Trinity. And you know what? He may not do it. Because even... Saved, redeemed, in heaven with still finite beings. And we may not be able ever to understand the fullness of the mystery of the miracle of God. But let me say some things to you to help you grasp the Trinity a little bit better. First, you know, we try to explain it and we say, well, you know, it's, it's kind of like water. Water is, can be a solid ice it could be a liquid, the actual liquid water, or it could be heated up and become a steam. And so water is ice and, and liquid and steam. But when ice is ice, it's not water. And when water is water, it's not steam. And when steam is steam, it's not ice. But God is always Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This uh, teaching that God can be ice, water, and steam is actually a heresy. It doesn't capture what God is. Or someone could say, well, you know, let's speak about myself. I'm a son. I'm a father. I'm a husband. So I'm, I'm three things at the same time. Well, I function three different ways, but I'm not three different people. I'm still just one person. And that, again, does not capture all that Jesus is. So what we're saying here is that, that rather than try to explain it, with some kind of lame illustration, we just accept it and express it the way the New Testament does, that Jesus is God in the flesh, fully God and fully man. And what your skeptical friends will say to you, now, now I want you to, I, you've got to get this one. This is so cool. Skeptics say something like this. Well, you know, uh, the early church got together in 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea. Have you ever heard this? And they voted that Jesus was God. It was just like a, a church business meeting. Somebody raised their hand and said, I move that Jesus is God. I second it. Everybody goes, here, here, here. They vote, raise their hands. All those favor Jesus is God, raise your hand. And, and it's unanimous. But here we have in Colossians the hymn of Jesus, already sung by the church before Paul even wrote Colossians, and it was written sometime in the 30 years between the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus and Paul's letter to the Colossians. The Colossians, as well as the entire church, already knew that Jesus was God. Now, I'm sorry, that makes me tingle a little bit. It wasn't voted on by the Council of Nicaea. The church has always thought that he who reconciled all things to himself is fully God and fully man. Jesus is supreme. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, right now we're thinking about Jesus, the great mystery and miracle of the Trinity. 
how he was your image. So when we see him, we see you. But more than that, when we know him, we know you. Your substance is in him. He created all things. He holds all things together. And this great, great Jesus lives still in the world as the head of his church. And if we love Jesus, we have to love his church too. And then, in him all your fullness dwelt. So he was both God and man. Part of the Trinity. Part of your expression of yourself to the world. And Lord, we just believe it and we just accept it. Right now, Father, there, there, there may be people here or watching online who uh, haven't yet been reconciled to Jesus as he reconciles all things. And I pray right now, Lord, that you'll speak to that person and lead them to a place of believing, accepting Christ and being reconciled to you, the great God. If you're that person I'm praying about, whether you're here or watching online, pray this prayer with me. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws and commands, and I pray that you'll forgive me based on what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. And I pray you'll come and live inside of me by the power of the Holy Spirit that I might know I'm saved and have a living relationship with you. That's my prayer I make, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that prayer with me, you're now part of God's family. Let me know what the card you find in the chair or the worship program form. Detach it and drop it in the box as you leave. Talk to online counselor. We have several online counselors who are waiting to talk to you, help you with your decision. We'll share with you more about how to grow in your faith. Heavenly Father, help us leave today with that one great idea in our minds that Jesus is supreme. In his name we pray. Amen. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Be sure to drop us a like. Subscribe and follow us on social media so you don't miss any future DC Church content.